Uh, Ken and Kim has said that it would be nice in this season of Lent if we did a, a, a sermon series on faith and continuing to have faith. Well, it's been on my mind a while, and last week, like everybody else, I was sick in bed, had this raging fever. You, you know the experience where you don't know whether you're too hot or too cold, you start shivering, and no matter what you do, you put more blankets up, you put blankets down, and nothing is working. I decided that would be the ideal time to start my sermon. <laughs> so as I'm working on my sermon, uh, it, it, it is like uh, this wonderful picture develops of the whole sermon all figured out. And I, I think, this is brilliant. And, and every piece was fitting in place. And it was all working together so wonderfully. At which point I passed out. <laughs> when I woke up in the morning, the fever had broken. And so had the sermon. <laughs> and I remembered absolutely nothing of all of this panoramic picture that I had the night before. Everything gone. Well, some days are just like that. But I do want to look for a while. In our generation, is it possible to have faith in God? We live in a generation that I would say would, would mock people of faith and say that people who have faith in God are, are just simpletons, that, that they are trying to believe something that is anti-science and that people of faith should be pitied. I, I take another opinion on all this. Now, I will say I think there are times in which our ancestors did not do us any favors by ascribing to God all of the things that we did not understand. Do you know what I mean? Things like, why does the sun come up in the morning? And Christian people, lovely people that they were, would say, well, you know, that's God's job. God gets a chariot and every morning puts the sun in this invisible chariot and would haul the sun up over the sky every day. And, and people would ask, why is it that in the middle of the day, on a cloudless day, sometimes the whole earth goes dark? And people would say, oh, well, that, that is God trying to get our attention, and God is darkening the sun in order that all of humanity will come and see and know that God is watching over us. Well, once science discovered things like gravity and, and rotation patterns of the planets and discovered that it's actually the Earth that's moving around the sun and the moon is rotating around the earth and explained a lot of things about why the sun goes up in the morning and why there are predictable things like solar eclipses that will darken the earth. And people said, so there is no need for faith. There is no need for God. Well, you see, we we attribute to God only the things that we don't understand rather than trying to give God God's due of the things that are important in life. You see, again, I, I would maintain people can't get up in the morning without having faith. People have faith just to, just to put your feet on the floor. Now, I never met the carpenter that built this platform that I'm standing on. Have no idea who it is. Might be people in this room. I don't know. But I am trusting that the carpenter who built the platform that I'm standing on knew something about carpentry, knew something about physics, knew something about which nails to use in the right situation so that I'm not going to go plummeting through to the basement as I talk here this morning. 
Now, I know Doug has said that there is a trap door. And when I go on far too long, which I am prone to do when I am on cold medications, that there will be a trap door that will open and I will fall to the basement. But I, I am trusting. I have faith that people who built this thing actually know what they're doing. I, I have this cute little wireless microphone here. I have no idea how it works. I am trusting that it is not at this moment frying my brain and that I am going to be more spaced out than I was last week on cold medication with a fever and that I'm actually going to be able to get through this and still have a brain left at the end of using this microphone. Everybody, in order to get out of bed in the morning, has to have faith. Every time I go through a green light, when I am driving, I have a modest amount of faith that says that the person who has a red light is also going to stop when I have the green light. You can't get out of bed without having faith. Now, that is a long way from having faith in the person of Jesus Christ. But I would maintain, if we can have faith in people that we have never seen and never met, is it that big a jump to say that we can also have faith in a God that we have not met in, in some respects and to still have faith in him? Not that big a jump. But it's also not that big a jump to look at who is Jesus and to have faith in him. Last week, Dr. Ian Scott gave a brilliant talk about the incontrovertible proof of the reality of Jesus Christ. No thinking person can actually say Jesus never existed. There is just a wealth of evidence. Nobody can say that it's all myth or made up or fantasy. Nobody can compare him like I did in a sermon a while ago to the Lone Ranger and say, well, Jesus is just one of those other wonderful people that came around. No, nobody can say that. The evidence of who Jesus is is absolutely solid. But the problem I find is people want to believe in the person of Jesus, but they want to believe in a watered-down Jesus. They just want to believe in some of the nice, kind things that he said and let it go at that. You know, I, I, I've met people who, when they talk of Jesus, the picture that I get as they describe Jesus was a 1960s hippie peacenik that went around saying, can't we all just get along? Can't we all just love each other? And that's how they see Jesus. Well, yeah, that, that's a part of who Jesus is. But what about how he was born? What about how he died? What about the miracles that were performed during his lifetime? Well, they, they say all that somehow really isn't important or necessary. But if you're going to believe in some of what Jesus said, do you then start to eliminate some of the rest of the stuff he said? Do you only pick and choose the parts of what Jesus said that you like and eliminate the parts that you don't like? What about Jesus saying things like, I and the Father are one? Or what about things like Jesus saying, I can forgive sins? Are we going to just eliminate all those? Are we going to say that that's the the rantings of a crazy person? Now, 
I've done some work in mental health. And I've met people who think they're God or who think that they are representatives of God here on earth to give us all the, the news that God wants to tell us. And anybody who listens to these people know that they're a few sheep short of a flock. And they, they are actually somebody who should be pitied rather than somebody who should be worshipped. But no one, no one would say that about Jesus. That when Jesus spoke, absolutely, he was revered. In fact, that's what got him killed. It wasn't because he went around saying nice, simple, mamby-pamby things about can't you just get along. That's not what got him killed. It was because he said the kingdom of God is breaking in right here, right now, in your midst, and I am ushering in a new kingdom of God. And people didn't say, well, let's forget those kind of parts. No, those were the parts that got him in trouble. Those were the parts that were authentic. And it was not just his teaching. It was the miracles that happened during his lifetime. So, some people get hung up around miracles and they, they can't really see it and, and want to find all kinds of other explanations for the miracles of Jesus. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the people, one of the scholars that I would read often is the man called William Barclay. Brilliant man. He took all of the historical works and, and put them together in a way that would make sense that when Jesus was telling a parable about camels going through eyes of needles and things that made absolutely no sense to us, William Barclay would give this whole long explanation that would make everything perfectly clear. But I will say, Barclay had a bias, and, and his bias was around miracles. Barclay was not real big on miracles. He, in fact, as I looked up what Barclay had to say about the feeding of the 5,000, an event that happened in all four Gospels has absolute clarity that the event happened. Here's what William Barclay, famed Christian scholar, wrote about the feeding of the 5,000. He said, it's scarcely to be thought that the crowd left on a nine-mile expedition without making any preparations at all. If there were pilgrims with them, they would certainly possess supplies for the way. But it may be that none would produce what they had, for he selfishly and very humanly wished to keep it all for himself. It may then be that Jesus, with that rare smile of his, produced the little store that he and his disciples had with sunny faith, he thanked God for it and shared it out. Moved by his example, everyone who had anything did the same. And in the end, there was enough and more than enough for all. It may be that this is a miracle in which the presence of Jesus turned a crowd of selfish men and women into a fellowship of sharers. It may be that this story represents the biggest miracle of all, one which changed not loaves and fishes, but men and women. William Barclay, with all due respect, I disagree. <laughs> I don't think that that's what the miracle of the loaves and fishes was about. More to the point, I think it is a bigger stretch of faith to say that the Christian faith continued all of this time 
because all Jesus did was teach people how to be kind. I think that takes more faith than to believe that the miracles really happened. So, we have to struggle with all this. Um, but then one might ask themselves, could it be that disciples in Jesus' day just wanted to embellish the story? And that those who were living at the time just wanted to, you know, kind of make it a little bit bigger and, and a little bit grander than it really was and, and to try and spread Jesus' fame abroad. I, I want to pick up on a theme that Dr. Scott introduced last week and, and just add to it a little bit more. To say, could that really be so that people would just take something and, and write about it and, and make it as if it were so? Well, what if we, in our time and in our generation, wanted to do something like that? What if somebody wanted to take a contemporary figure and make them into something bigger than what they were? Who shall I pick on? Michael Jackson. So somebody wants to write the untold story of Michael Jackson the miracle worker. And in this untold story of Michael Jackson, the miracle worker, they talk about people coming by the car load, the bus load, the van load to Michael Jackson's estate where Michael Jackson would then lay hands on people and they would all be healed and go home and just be so thankful for the miracle of Michael Jackson. How long do you think after Michael Jackson's death could they write that story? Five years? Ten years? Well, there would still be people around Michael Jackson's gardener, Michael Jackson's cook, Michael Jackson's chief of security who would stand up and say, you know what? That never happened. It would have to be a hundred years or more after Michael Jackson's death before somebody could begin to write that story of Michael Jackson, the miracle worker. Because otherwise, somebody would stand up and say, that is such bunk. So, as Ian pointed out last week, if we look at some of the earliest records within the Christian church, how long were they written after Jesus' death? Well, look for a moment at Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. In that... In chapter 15, St. Paul starts to talk about the resurrection. And in that chapter 15, he says, well, you know that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. You know that he went and talked to Peter and that he talked to the disciples and the women. And he said, you've heard all this before, and I am just telling you, if there is no resurrection, then our faith is nonsense. But if there is a resurrection, and we all know there is, then our faith is in the faith of God that is changing the world around us. How long after Jesus' death did uh, Paul pen those words? Nobody can be absolutely sure, but to the best scholarly evidence that we have, Jesus might have died somewhere around the year 30. And Paul's letter to the first letter to the Corinthians was penned probably around the year 55. So that means at most 25 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, there are already full, complete 
stories of his life out there. And Paul was even saying, I'm only writing down here what you've already read before and what you've already seen before. There were documents even before that that Paul is quoting. At most 25 years after Jesus' death, it is clearly out there about the resurrection. And people aren't standing up and saying, whoa, wait a minute, no, that, that never happened. No, people are actually receiving these letters and honoring them and making sure that they get preserved. That's what happens in the Christian faith. Well, in the end, no matter how much logic, wisdom, documents we try to show you? Is it possible to actually convince someone of the presence of the resurrected Christ and to bring them to faith? Words alone will probably never be adequate. In that, let me ask you, can, can you right now prove the existence of Justin Trudeau. Can, can you prove to me that there is a Justin Trudeau right here, right now? Can you, can you prove that to me? I, I don't think you can. You, you can tell me all kinds of stories about him and, and you can tell me what he's done and where he might be at the moment, but right here, right now, you cannot prove to me the existence of Justin Trudeau. But over time, I can come to know who Justin Trudeau is. In fact, one day I might even get to meet him and to know who he is and to know that he exists. And in the same way, I cannot convince anyone through words alone of the presence of Jesus Christ who lived, died, and rose again. But I can say with every conviction in my heart that when we open ourselves to that presence of God and say, God, if you are really there, will you demonstrate yourself to me in a way that I can understand? And I have every confidence that God will say yes. It is not through words alone, but it is through our experience of the resurrected Christ that we will know within ourselves. May we be that people of God that stand in faith in the midst of a doubting generation and will be able to say, it, it's not all fluff and nonsense. It is the truth of the power of God living and working among us. And may we who have been touched by that presence of God live a life that will draw others into that living presence of God as well. Amen.